آمن الرسول بما أنزل إليه من ربه والمؤمنون كل آمن بالله وملائكته وكتبه ورسله لا نفرق بين أحد من رسله وقالوا سمعنا وأطعنا غفرانك ربنا وإليك المصير رب الشرح صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أمين يا رب العالمين I'd like to start by saying it's really good to be back in Bahrain Alhamdulillah and as you can probably hear I will be using my singing voice today so uh, make dua that I'm able to you know, keep the voice that Allah Azza wa Jal preserves the voice as much as possible so I can communicate to you what I hope to communicate to you inshaAllah ta'ala this evening um, I've been thinking about giving a lecture on the concluding ayat of Surah Al-Baqarah for about two years and I've held back and I said I don't know if what's the right occasion to do that and inshaAllah ta'ala I hope to at least give it a first attempt here tonight and I pray that I'm able to do justice uh, to the subject, it is one of the most beautiful places in the entire Qur'an. It is special for many, many, many reasons. I'll mention only one of them right now, and we'll come back to that reason at the end of our talk again. We all know that the Qur'an was given to the Prophet ﷺ in the land of Hijaz, and it was revealed over the course of 23 years. And the way that Allah delivered the Qur'an to the Prophet ﷺ is through the angel Gabriel, through Jibreel alayhi salam. The only exception, the only part of the Qur'an that was not given to the Prophet sallallahu through Jibreel alayhi salam, but rather through authentic narrations we learn, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam traveled up to this, up the seven heavens and right under it, you know, عِنْدَ سِدْرَةِ الْمُنْتَهَى as is described in Surah Al-Najm, when he traveled all the way up there, it is there that he received the last two ayat of Surah Al-Baqarah. In other words, all of the Qur'an was sent down to the earth. The two ayat that we are going to talk about tonight, the messenger went to the sky to get them. They were not given on the earth. They, were, they, were, they had to be received by the messenger himself under the throne of Allah Azza wa Jal. So they have a special, special place in the Qur'an. Not only do they have a special place in the Qur'an, these ayat actually have a special place in uh, Surah Al-Baqarah. And so in the beginning of my talk, I will share with you some parts of uh, the theory and the principles of Qur'an study beyond this, you know, the, the universal ulum al-Qur'an, uh, the sciences of the study of Qur'an that many people are familiar with, especially those of you that study tafsir. I'm not going to make this an academic topic, by the way. I will try my best not to complicate the subject, inshallah ta'ala. Even those of you that don't know any Arabic, and I'm sure there are lots of you who don't know any Arabic, it's okay, don't be intimidated. I'm gonna to try to make it as easy to understand as possible. Uh, I try to do that as much, as much of my talks to keep things simple, because I have a history in my childhood and early years of getting a, a lot of really good sleep during the khutbah. And so, uh, that's because as soon as the the khatib or the alim or the shaykh starts getting super high academic, then you, it's like he's releasing sleeping gas from his mouth and you just, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun, right? And, and so first thing you hear is inna alhamdulillah and the next thing you hear is aqib salat That's the only thing you hear. So, <laughs> so we'll try not to do that inshaAllah ta'ala. But anyway, one of the cool things I want to share with you is that um, one of the most fascinating studies in the Qur'an uh, is actually how the, the surahs of the Qur'an are organized. And this is actually a number of different subjects together. The first subject is, how are the surahs themselves organized? Fatiha is first, Baqarah is second, Ali Imran is third, etc, etc. Why are they in this order? Uh, because from a, from a Western academic standpoint, um, and by the way, I, when I, the first time I studied Qur'an seriously, it was not from Muslims. It was from non-Muslims. And when they study the Qur'an, they don't say, Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam wa ala rasulillah. They begin, like they study any literature, they start with criticism. We, we start, when we study the book of Allah, we begin with hamd, we begin with praise. We begin with iman that this is the best, you know, وَالرَّاسِخُونَ فِي الْعِلْمِ يَقُولُنَا آمَنَّا بِهِ كُلُّ مِنْ عِنْدِ رَبِّنَا Okay, this is what we say. That's not what they say. They begin with criticism, skepticism. And so the first exposure, one of the first serious exposures I had to the Qur'an was actually criticism. And the first criticism was the Qur'an is unorganized. The surahs are in this random order 
and the subject keeps going from one to the other and even they call them chapters of the, uh, the Quran right that's what they call it but they don't call it surah they call it a chapter even though a chapter and a surah are not the same thing at all they're not the same I personally don't agree with the translation of surah as chapter I don't because there's a certain standard in literature for a chapter a chapter has logical points that are made in chronology and if a chapter like chapter 5 is going to repeat something from chapter 3 they won't do it the same way they'll just say refer back to chapter 3 that's what chapters do they're built chronologically the other thing about chapters is you cannot begin a book with chapter 12 you can't do it you have to begin with chapter what? 1 and 1 is the first thing the author writes then the author writes 2 then the author writes 3 then the author writes 4 and even the student has to study chapter 1 first and then 2 and then 3 and then 4 but when the Quran was revealed the, the first surah revealed Iqra bi rabbika alladhi khalaq where is that in the Quran? is that in the beginning? that's all the way at the end so if you're studying Quran right now from the beginning you're going to read the first revelation at the end of your journey it's very different so then the, the order is not even the order in which it was revealed it's not chronological the other problem is the order you know understandably the order is not it doesn't seem to be organized by subject what that means is that you know the subject matter in the Quran um, like in Surah Al-Baqarah today we're talking about Surah Al-Baqarah the biggest surah of the Quran 286 ayat revealed over several years one part of it is actually Makki the last two ayat are Makki these were revealed at the Mi'raj so the most of the surah is revealed after the Prophet migrated but two ayat are from before he migrated so this surah took almost a decade and some say the last ayat to be revealed in the Quran belonged to Baqarah which means it began when the Prophet was still in Mecca and it went on for another decade so this surah took a long time to come down it didn't come down in one shot now having said that Baqarah if you study it in the beginning it's believers and disbelievers you know believers and disbelievers it talks about hypocrites which is the third subject right uh, you know the, 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 the hypocrites then it talks about the story of Adam alayhi salam then there's this huge section on the history of, of the Israelites Banu Israel Ya Bani Israel, alaykum. A long section. And by the way, even inside that section, there is no chronology. Meaning some of the events that happened in Jewish history later are mentioned before. And things that happened before are mentioned later. So it's not even chronological inside. Then it jumps over to Ibrahim alayhi salam. And after Ibrahim alayhi salam, it jumps over to the change of the Kaaba. And after the change, because we used to pray towards Jerusalem. You know that, right? We used to pray towards Jerusalem and then it switched over to the, the Kaaba. And then it goes straight over to, you know, the, the, this Ummah. وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا وَلَا نَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ وَنَقْسِ مِنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ This Ummah will be tested, Allah tells us. And one of the first big tests was when we changed the direction of our prayer. You know? And then after that, it's all these laws which don't seem connected at all. There's laws about fasting, there's laws about going to Hajj, there's laws about divorce, which is totally out of left field. I was going to learn fasting, Hajj, okay the next thing will be about spirituality also. Then it's divorce, fighting, divorce, spending, infaq, fi sabilillah, riba, ahkam of riba. It's all, all over the place. And then it concludes with this prayer. At the end of it all is this prayer that we're going to study today. So when the Western academic looks at this, he says, the Qur'an is completely disconnected. It's just all these random verses that they, and by the way, I don't agree with chapter and I don't agree with verse, which I'll get to later. <laughs> ayah is ayah. It's just an ayah. You can't compare it to anything else. So they look at it and they say the Qur'an is disorganized. Before I tell you about these ayat, what I want to share with you is how Surah Al-Baqarah itself is organized in maybe 10 minutes or less. Because I personally, I find it impossible to talk about the Qur'an, to, to talk about ayat in the Qur'an without telling you what neighborhood they come from. You have to, you, if you want to understand the house, 
you have to understand the neighborhood. كما يقول العرب الجار ثم الدار. Right? So you got to understand the vicinity, then you understand where you are. Right? So now my, my first point was, when you study it from a critical perspective, it seems like the Qur'an is unorganized. But let's start over again. The first conversation in Surah Al-Baqarah is about believers contrasted with disbelievers and in the middle of both of them are hypocrites. Believers, disbelievers and hypocrites. The last subject of Surah Al-Baqarah is this dua. This is the last topic of Surah Al-Baqarah. And in this last topic we make dua to Allah basically to preserve our iman and to not fall into forgetfulness and keep making mistakes because people who forget and keep making mistakes they fall into hypocrisy long enough they fall into nifaq and the ayah ends the surah ends when surna ala al kafirin it goes back to disbelievers in other words the first subject of the quran and the last sub or, or, or the surah and the last subject of the surah are actually very very similar and directly related to each other the second subject of the surah was Adam alayhi salam. قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِمَلَائِكَ إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةً The ayat about Adam alayhi salam. Anyone, you can call it out loud. What was the reason for which Adam alayhi salam and our mother were taken out of Jannah? What was the reason? Huh? Sisters are louder than brothers? Is this a Bahrain thing? <laughs> What was the reason? Call it out, it's okay. It's not a khutbah, the lecture will not be nullified. You're supposed to stay quiet in a khutbah. Huh? Huh? Disobe what disobedience? There's lots of, there's like a million kinds of disobedience. Which kind of disobedience was it? Desire? I don't know about that. Well, it's not an apple, that's what the Bible says. <laughs> you can eat apples and still go to Jannah. Okay, relax. One word, greed. Greed. You have all of Jannah. All of, how many trees in Jannah? How many trees you're not supposed to go near? Jannah is bigger than the earth or no? Is the entire earth covered in trees? No. But if you were in a jungle on the earth and you were told one tree, stay away from one tree, chances are you won't even see that tree your whole life. Because it's so big. But somehow shaitan fadalla huma bi ghurur, like is mentioned in Surah Al-A'raf, somehow he convinced them that of all the fruits and all the trees and all the rivers and all the lakes of Jannah, this one you're missing out, man. You gotta try that one. Greed. The second subject, Adam alayhi salam, is actually about greed. If you go to the end of Baqarah, the second last subject is actually about spending in the path of Allah. الانفاق في سبيل الله مثل الذين ينفقون أموالهم في سبيل الله كمثل حبة أنبتت سبع سناب في كل سنبلة مئة حبة والله يضاعف لي من شر. What are these ayat about? Longest passages in the Quran. Spend in the path of Allah. Spend in the path of Allah. Spend in the path of Allah. And then he talks about business. Actually, before he talks about business, he says the people who take riba. الذين يأكلون First he says the best thing you can do with your money is spend in the path of Allah. Then he says the worst thing you can do with your money is do riba, usury, interest. Then he says the acceptable thing you can do with your money is business and loan agreements. That's why the long ayat of Dain balances those two sides. Now, if you study all of that, at the end of the day, all of those ayat together, that is guidance for human beings to control their greed. Spending, why do people take riba? Why do they take riba? Greed. Why do people cheat in business? Greed. Why don't people spend in the path of Allah? Greed. 
The story of Adam alayhi salam was about what? Greed. That's the second subject. The second last subject is greed. The third subject in Surah Al-Baqarah is the Israelites, Banu Israel. And how they were given lots of regulations and they kept breaking the rules. Allah would give them rules and they would break the rules. This is Bani Israel, long section, lots of different history. If you go backwards in Surah Al-Baqarah, the third subject before it ends, the third last subject is the laws given to the Muslims. Laws given to Banu Israel on that side, laws given to the Muslims on this side. The fourth subject, by the way, do you see a symmetry? Believers, disbelievers, hypocrites. Believers, disbelievers, hypocrites. The story of Adam, the regulations on greed, the laws to the Jews, the laws to the Muslims, the trials of Ibrahim alayhi salam. The trials of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And on the other side, He's going to test you. He tested Ibrahim alayhi salam. And because you are the nation of your father, who? Ibrahim, you are the religion of your father Ibrahim. Millata abikum Ibrahim. On the other side, the sixth subject is actually we are going to be tested, just like Ibrahim alayhi salam was tested. It's really interesting. Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he made dua for us, he made dua of a different, a couple of different things. So he made dua that we should be safe, and he made dua that we should eat well, we should have rizq. If you look at the tests, on the other side, he says, Ibrahim salam said, Ya Allah, keep them safe. And Allah says, I will test you with fear. When are you afraid? When you don't feel safe. Then he says, Ibrahim said, give them all kinds of fruit. And Allah says, I will test them with hunger. Fruit on this side, hunger on the other side. SubhanAllah. And these people say, Quran is not organized. And in the middle of the surah, in the middle, middle, middle of the surah, Allah Azza wa talks about the change of the Kaaba, which is the middle of this nation. This, this, this entire ummah is centered around the Kaaba. And the Kaaba was built by who? Ibrahim alayhi salam, who is in the middle of both of these nations. Ibrahim himself is in the middle of Banu Israel and Banu Ismail. He's in the middle of both of them. And this house that was built is mentioned in the middle. And then because of this house, this was when the Kaaba was finally you know, given its status again. Then Allah says, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ what? Ummatan وَسَطًا So now that you have a new capital, when a nation has a capital, then they have to be inaugurated as a nation. You know, a new nation has to have a capital and then they become a new sovereign nation. The Ummah became a new sovereign nation. And so we were called Ummah and Wasata. By the way, that is ayah number 143. We are called the middle nation in ayah number what? 143. How many ayat in Baqarah? 286. We are called the middle nation in the middle ayah. Quran is not organized. <laughs> Anyway, what I want to talk to you about tonight is the last ayat of Baqarah. That were given when? I forgot. Where were they given to Prophet ﷺ? Up in the heavens. They didn't come down, he went up. And these ayat were given at a place so crazy. You know Jibreel alayhi salam, he has a very high station. عِنْدَ ذِي الْعَرْشِ مَكِينَ He's a very high place. And he is the he delivers the Prophet ﷺ all the way up. But there is some security clearance even he does not have. He does not have that much security clearance. Only Rasulullah can go. If Jibreel ﷺ tries to go, his wings will burn off. So he, the Rasul ﷺ goes by himself. These are ayat. Not only did Jibreel ﷺ not give it to them. Jibreel السلام, could not give it to him. He could not do it. They had to come from Allah in that place. SubhanAllah. Those are these, these ayat. And these ayat begin, and this is what I'm going to do now, inshaAllah ta'ala, 
show you how the beginning and the end of the surah are remarkably connected to appreciate what's happening at the end of the surah. By the way, what did I say? Did this whole surah come down at the same time? It took a long time, yeah? So when it takes a long time, are there other surahs that are being revealed at the same time? In the middle. So you could think of it like there are multiple open projects. None, one, no one of them is finished. And when some ayat come down, the Prophet knows sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, these ayat, hadhi al-ayat li tilka surah. He knows which ayat goes to which surah, he knows. And this, all of this is put together, you know, ala qalbika, nazala bihi al ala qalbik. It's in his heart, there's no documentation, there's no papers. Oh, this ayah should put here, you should put it here. There's no Microsoft Word where you can copy paste the paragraphs and put, there's nothing. It's all in his heart. It's all he's got. Khair. The first statement, آمَنَ الرَّسُولُ بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ رَبِّهِ وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ The Messenger, the Messenger والسلام, believed in what was sent down to him from his Rabb. And so did the believers. I want you to imagine this situation. Allah is telling this ayah to Rasulullah وسلم, directly. Okay. Bila hijab. He's telling him directly. And the thing he tells him is that the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. See, if you're talking to someone, if I talk to you, if you're for example a professor, I say you are sitting here. I don't say the professor is sitting here. Because if I'm talking to you, I use the second person. I don't use the third person. But Allah is talking to the Messenger alayhi salatu wa salam. What does he say? Amana al-Rasul. La, lam yaqul, amanta. Amanta, yukhatibu mubasharatan alayhi kedalik. He's talking to him directly. He didn't say you believed. He said the Messenger believed sallallahu alayhi wa salam. Wa hadha takreeman lil nabi alayhi salatu wa salam. Even in his presence, he speaks of him in the third person to honor him alayhi salatu wa salam. The Messenger is not just any Messenger. The Messenger believed. And Allah is letting him know that when Jibreel first came, alayhi salam, when Jibreel first came, even the messenger had to accept Islam. Like you know we say somebody converted to Islam, somebody reverted to Islam, somebody took shahada. Well the messenger alayhi salatu wasalam, also had to in a sense become Muslim when the, when the angel came. <coughs> and that moment was a big moment. When the angel came, he has no idea what's going on. He has no clue what this is yet. When he's being shaken and he's being told, Iqra, read, read. He has no idea what's going on. Ma'ana biqari. This is an incredible scene. And when, when Rasulullah goes up to meet with Allah, Allah reminds him of that scene. amanta bima unzila ilayk. آمَنَ الرَّسُولُ بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْهِ The Messenger believed in what was revealed to him. You know what's remarkable about that? In the beginning of the surah, what are the first words? أَلِفْ لَامْ مِيمْ ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابِ ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابِ What does أَلِفْ لَامْ مِيمْ mean, people? What does it mean? ALM? What does it mean? Allah, Allah, Allah knows. We don't know. You know why that's important? For many reasons. One of the reasons is that before you study the Quran, the first thing you need to know is that you don't know anything. So the first ayah tells you what you're worth. You know, la ilma lana illa ma alamtana. And if you don't have that attitude, you cannot understand the rest of the Quran. Forget it. But understand this: Did the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Did he know how to read? وَمَا كُنْتَ تَتْلُو مِنْ قَبْلِهِ مِنْ كِتَابِ وَمَا تَخُطُّهُ بِيَمِينِكَ النَّبِيَ الْأُمِّي You know, he doesn't know how to read. Now when someone does not know how to read, the word alif doesn't make any sense. The word lam doesn't make any sense. The word meme doesn't make any sense. Because these are letters of the alphabet. And the only people who learn the alphabet are people who learn how to what? Read. So the first thing that was given in the surah is reminding you that the messenger himself والسلام, has no clue how to read and yet out of his mouth comes the word alif, lam, meem which is impossible for someone who doesn't read. That's like saying somebody doesn't know anything about English 
They don't know any alphabet, they don't know any reading, but they say W, P, R. The word R, W, P, Q, X, these words don't mean anything. These letters don't mean anything on their own. They only mean something when you go to school and you learn the alphabet. Now why is that important? It's important because when the message began and the messenger was told, read. Isn't that the same? Isn't that as impossible as the messenger knowing Alif and Lam and Mim? Isn't that the same problem? The surah actually begins with almost a reminder of the fact that the messenger cannot read, he is made to read. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then it says, وَلَمْ يَقُلْ ذَلِكَ الْقُرْآنِ He didn't say this, that Qur'an. He said, ذَلِكَ kitab. What does kitab mean? Something written. And something written can only benefit someone who can what? Read. This messenger والسلام, is impossible for him to read. It has to be given to him. By the way, those of you who know uh, Nahu, Tha is called Ism Ishara. Al-Lamu Lit-Tanbih. Al-Kaf Dhamir. You know, and they said Al-Lam Lit-Tawkeel or Lil-Bu'd also. And then they say Al-Kaf Lit-Tanbih. Thalika, which is translated as the word that, is actually just Tha. Grammatically, it's just Tha. The lam makes it further distant. The kaf refers to the, pro, the, pro, the person you're talking to. Let me make that easy. If I was talking to you and I said, hey, look over there. Now I'm pointing over there, but I'm trying to get your attention, yeah? So how do I point over there and get your attention? I say, dali ki. Dali ki. The key is for her, so she can pay attention over there. And that lets me know that I'm pointing for the benefit of one person. If I was pointing over there for the benefit of all of you, I would say ذَلِكُمْ <coughs> Do you find ذَلِكُمْ in the Qur'an? Sure. When the angels were talking to Maryam, Salamun alayha, they don't say ذَلِكَ They say قَالُوا كَذَلِكِ Why? Because they're getting her attention. Now when the ayah says ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابِ Then the car refers to one person. Who's that? First and foremost, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So that book that has been given to you, ذلك الكتاب لا ريبا فيه. What I'm trying to say, here's the summarized point. What I'm trying to say is the beginning of Baqarah talks about the, the belief of the messenger himself. In what words? Alif, Lam, Mim is about the messenger himself. ذلك الكتاب is about the messenger himself. لا ريبا فيه هدن لل فكنا نتوقع هدن لك no, 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 not guidance for you. It is guidance for who? Lil Muttaqeen. So in the beginning of the surah, there's a transition. Belief in the messenger. And why, why does he have to believe in this book? Why does he have to have no doubt whatsoever? Because it will serve as guidance for the people of taqwa, which means the rest of us. Yeah? Now look at the end of the surah. Aman al bima unzila ilayhim al what is that part talking about? The messenger believed in what was revealed to him from his Rabb. Who is that talking about? Rasulullah And then it switches over immediately. Wal mu'minun. And the believers. Just like the beginning. It started with Rasul and switched over to the believers. The end also starts with the Rasul and goes over to the believers. Wal mu'minun. Subhanallah. How do you do that with kalam that is years and years apart? Even down to the sentence. Even down to the sentence. Now I want you to think about this. I, I've talked to you about this before, but I, this is important to refresh. I am a student of psychology. And in psychology studies, you study something called abnormal behavior. It's called abnormal behavior. How do you define abnormal behavior? All the cars are going this way. One car is going that way. That guy is crazy. He's doing abnormal behavior. I'm talking to you in English, you talk to me in Mandarin. That's everybody speaking in English, you're speaking in Mandarin, you have abnormal behavior. Everybody's dressed up, you're not wearing a shirt. Abnormal behavior. How do you define abnormal behavior? When someone does something, nobody else is doing it. Everybody's doing one thing, this guy is doing something else. That is, by the way, the definition of abnormal behavior. And when people behave in an abnormal way, 
they are considered crazy. If you're not a psychologist, if you're a psychologist, you'll say this person is manic, delusional, schizophrenic, some kind of diagnosis. If you don't know psychology, you'll say, Pagal banda. You just call them crazy. Majnoon. Okay, that's what you'll say. Now, the Prophet ﷺ lived in Mecca for how long before he became a Prophet? 40 years. 40 years. 40 years later, the angel comes to him, gives him wahi. He believes it. I'm on the Rasul. He had to believe too. It was a leap of faith for him too. He couldn't, he couldn't understand what was happening to him. You remember how he was in shock and the mother of the believers had to calm him down? And she had to say, and he had to get confirmation from Warqai bin Naufal. This is the same angel that brings wahi. He needed confirmation himself. It doesn't happen automatically. He needs affirmation too. But now imagine that you live in Mecca. You live in Mecca. And your neighbor, in your neighborhood, there's a man, his name is Muhammad. And you have known him for 40 years. Your family knows him for 40 years. Really nice man. Very honest, very kind, very gentle, very reliable. And then one day, after 40 years, he comes to your house. He knocks on the door. Hey, how's it going? Hey, listen, I want to talk to you about something. Last night, an angel came to me. When I was out in the middle of the cave, I was, I was spending a lot of time in the cave, and an angel came. And he grabbed me. And he shook me. And he told me to read. And I told him I don't know how to read. But then he made me read anyway. And so, uh, I am the messenger of Allah. I am the me you're laughing, you're right, you should be laughing. I am the messenger of Allah. I know you have known me for 40 years as your neighbor, but today, I am no longer just your neighbor. I am no longer just your friend. I am the messenger of Allah. Messenger of God, who He sends an angel to. And I say, what did you have for dinner last night? <laughs> Are you feeling okay? What? And by the way, not only am I... Is that easy to believe or hard to believe? It's very hard to believe. It's very hard to believe. It's not easy to believe. And if you like him, you're not his enemy, you're his neighbor. You like him. You feel bad for him. Wouldn't you? If somebody came to you in 2015 and said, I, so, you know, an angel speaks to me, you would say, poor guy, the hospital is that way. <laughs> That's what you would do. But you know what? 1400 years ago is not any different. If you were living at that time and somebody said, an angel speaks to me, you would say exactly the same thing. Your first reaction would be that this man has lost his mind, poor man has gone insane. That's what you would, even if you felt good, you're not making fun of him. You feel bad for him. He used to be such a nice man. What happened to him? Who gets worried about you? Your family gets worried about you. Your neighbors get worried about you. They feel bad for you. Everybody else thinks you're crazy. The only one who says you're not crazy is you. Now you tell me, if you live in Bahrain, and there's one man, everybody calls him crazy. And he says, no, all of you are crazy because you don't believe me. Who are we going to think is right? The population or that one man? That one man? You and I are Muslims today, it's very easy. Being Muslim today is not crazy. Why not? We are one-fifth of the world's population. <laughs> It's very easy to be Muslim. Because you have other people who are doing it too. And you find validation. But if you're the only one, that is hard. And I tell you, it was hardest for Rasulullah himself. It was the hardest. He knows, he's a very intelligent man. He knows that when he goes down and he speaks to the people, what are they going to call him? They're going to call him insane. Did they call him Majnoon by the way? Yeah. Yeah. So now, 
The messenger himself has to take a leap of faith. The messenger himself والسلام, had to come to believe, had to be convinced himself. By the way, if everybody calls you crazy, is there a chance you might start thinking maybe they're right? Possible, yeah? Maybe I should take some medication? The messenger والسلام, how many people telling him he's crazy? <coughs> and, but, and then they say, some people say, you know what? Okay, you're not crazy. Where's the angel? Can you see him? No, you can't, you can't see him. You can't see him. You guys know about the Hadith Jibreel? You guys know about Hadith Jibreel? When a man walked in and sat down and asked him about Islam and then what? Iman and then what? Yeah, it's a very famous Hadith. And then he left. And Rasul Sallallahu says, you know who that was? And they say, no. And then he says, who was he? Jibreel. If you were sitting there, it was like, That was Jibreel? Really? This is an act of faith. You really have to do it. You know, bil ghaib is not a small thing. It's a big thing. And it was much bigger for them. By the way, he's the only one who believes. And anybody who believes in him will also be called what? Crazy. What's wrong with you? Why are you joining this cult? You know, these people believe in angels. You know, this man says his words come from God. <laughs> this is what you would hear. And he has heard this for so long. And now he goes to meet with Allah. And Allah tells him, I appreciate your iman. Amana rasul bima unzila ilayhi min rabbi. So beautiful. Look at the words. Amana rasul bima anzal Allah. La. Bima anzalna ilayk. La. It's called the Al-Madhi Al-Mabnil Al-Majhul, the passive form. You know, the, let me, again, simple English, let me tell you what that means. You say in English, um, it was sent down. You don't say, I sent it down, you say, it was sent down. When you say, it was sent down, for, for example, if I say, it was said. What's the question that comes in your mind when I say, it was said? For example, if I say good things were said, by who? By who? That man was killed. By who? My cake was eaten. By who? When you say the passive form, there's a question. The question is, who? When he says it was sent down, what question does it create? Who? By who? Who sent it down? Allah made the language mysterious on purpose. Just like he did in the beginning of the surah. وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْبِنُونَ بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ وَمَا أُنزِلَ مِنْ لَمْ يَقُلْ أَنزَلْنَاهُ إِلَيْكَ أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ وَمَا أُنزِلَ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ Again at the end of the surah. It's a mystery. What was sent down? Now what was sent down? Is a, and the, the first time he heard it, he didn't even know what was happening. It's coming down, but I don't know what this is from. So Allah adds, مِنْ رَبِّهِ Then he solves the mystery. Then he says, the first unzila, ilahi then min rabbihi. Then from his master. There are easier ways to say this. And naqul fi min qawaid al lugha khayru al kalami ma qalla wa dalla. Aman al rasulu bima anzala rabbuhu ilahi. Akal. Unzila ilahi min rabbihi. Fahadha fal fa'il, thumma dhakara al fa'il. Subhanallah. First he doesn't mention who did it, then he mentions who did it. Look, you know, let me tell you in English. Easy. The cake was eaten by me. What's an easier way to say that, guys? I ate the cake. Why you got to talk like Star Wars? You can just say, I ate the cake. You know, that book was published by... No, they published the book. See, easy. He made it a mystery because that's exactly the journey. When you first hear this kalam, you don't know what hit you. What is this? I don't know what this is. It's, some, it's not from here, it's from somewhere else. And then eventually you discover it is from your Rabb. 
Just like that, the journey is captured in Unzila ilayhi min rabbihi. Look at the journey of Umar radiallahu anhu. He hears the kalam hiding behind the khilaf al Kaaba. He hears the kalam, hears the speech of Allah, and first response, Ma ajab hadha shair. Ooh, this is nice poetry. Wa ma huwa bi qawli shair. It's not the word of a poet. So, where is it from then? Kahin? Wa la bi qawli kahin. And then finally he understands مِن رَبِّهِ تَنزِيلٌ مِن رَبِّ الْحَالَكِينَ You know, it's sent down from the master, from the Rabb. I'll move along. So now, where is the messenger again? Where is this ayah coming from? No human being has ever been there. This is the only time. This is the closest we've ever, human, humanity has ever been to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The next closest thing in the history of humanity was Musa alayhi salam and he didn't get higher than a mountain. He was on top of a mountain and he spoke with Allah. Yeah? But you know when Allah Azza wa Jal says, you know, Jikta ala qadharin ya Musa, you came right on time. Exactly. And Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came, he had a, different, a much higher appointment. <laughs> SubhanAllah. Now he is up there talking to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he says to him, Amana Rasulu bima unzila ilayhi min rabbihi wal mu'minun my goodness and the believers did it too he mentioned us there i understand the rasul is mentioned alayhi salatu wasalam but anybody who believes in that messenger and firms their iman in the messenger has also been mentioned in the company of allah in the highest of all revelation in the quran this belief, you and I, our Iman, there is nothing more noble. You will not find dignity and respect anywhere, anywhere higher. You know, you feel special if the, the principal of the school calls your name. Yeah? You feel special at the award ceremony when they invite the Ra'is. Right? And he gives you an award, he calls your name and he gives you an award. You feel special if the president of a country, the king of a country, they call you and they have a personal meeting and they mention you. Hey, he talked about me? Hey, he mentioned my name? The Messenger والسلام, is in the greatest throne there ever was. And you are being talked about. These ayat are special. These ayat have elevated the believer like no other ayat. We are being mentioned in, the, in that company, subhanAllah. Every time you recite these ayat, you and I should remember the station that Allah has given us. No Muslim is insignificant to Allah. No Muslim is insignificant. I don't know your names. I don't, I don't know. Allah knows every one of your names. And every one of you that has real iman in their heart has been mentioned in the heart. Every one of you. In that one word, wal mu'minun. Beginning with the Sahaba and until now. And then, so that's the, the first honor, right? But the second honor, the second honor that I wanted to highlight is that Allah Azza wa Jal in the Quran describes the greatness of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we know we will never be close to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi He's always going to be here, we're always going to be down here. No matter if we were the best we could ever be, we could not come close to the dust on his feet. It's never going to happen. وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ فِيكُمْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ There's some the higher status. But in this one ayah, he didn't just bring himself, he didn't just bring you close to Allah, he brought you close to Rasulullah too, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. كَيْفْ كُلٌّ آمَنَا What does the word kull include? It includes the, the messenger and it includes you. In the previous ayah, it was the Rasul believed and the believers believed. There were two words. There were two words. Now in the next statement, Kullun combines both of us together. Now we are inseparable. Kullun amana billahi. Every one of them, everyone, every single one believed. Now Allah put me and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the same word. He put us in the same word. SubhanAllah, the closeness that Allah wants us to have to Rasulullah is inside this one word, Kullun. 
amana billahi wa malaikatihi wa kutubihi wa rusulihi every one of them believed in allah and his angels and his books and his messengers now why I mention all of this the muslims are the last ummah that will walk this earth they are the last ummah all the books before us the best of them has been recorded in the quran are there things in the quran that were from the the wahi given to Dawood alayhi salam? Yeah? Are there things in the Qur'an from what was given to Ibrahim alayhi salam? Yeah? Are there things in the Qur'an from what was given to Musa alayhi salam? Yeah? Does the Torah have what the Qur'an has? No, only a little bit. Does the Injil have what the Qur'an has? No, only a little bit. We have the best of every one of the previous revelations. Actually believing in this one book is truly the definition of believing in all the previous books. And this is so important to understand. You know, we think that the Christians and the Jews, they also believe in the prophets. They also have Abraham, they also have Noah, they also have Moses, yes? Let me tell you, they do believe in those prophets, but they don't believe in those prophets. They do and they don't. If you study Moses in the Bible, and you study Musa in the Quran, السلام, it's like you're talking about two different people. If you study Ibrahim السلام, in the Quran, and you study Abraham in the Bible, and the things they say about him in the Bible, you will not believe that that is Ibrahim السلام, they're talking about. You will not believe it. I've experienced this, I've had conversations with rabbis and ministers, about Abraham, about Noah, about Moses. I have learned many things from them. And the most important things I've learned is, they don't know what a Rasul means. They don't know what that means. You know, Ibrahim alayhi salam, Abu al-Anbiya alayhi salam, Khalil al-Rahman, that Nabi, that great Rasul, Ibrahim alayhi salam, when they talk about him, I was asking a rabbi, I was talking to him. I said, what do you believe about Abraham? What is the biggest lesson you learn from Abraham? And you know what the Muslims learn, right? If qala lahu rabbuhu aslim, qala aslam tuli rabbil alim. That is what we learn from Ibrahim alayhi salam. How do you submit to Allah? So I'm asking the rabbi, what do you learn from Abraham? And the rabbi tells me, good friend of mine, he tells me, well what we learn is that we have the right to argue with God. Say that again. Yeah, we learn to argue with God. From who? From Abraham. I was like, Wait, 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 hold on a second. What we learn from Abraham is that there are no arguments, you just submit. The one man who is the greatest example that you never argue with Allah, you just submit, is who? Ibrahim alayhi salam. And the rabbi tells me that Abraham inspired us to argue with God. <laughs> Talk about reverse engineering, dude. This is reverse engineering. How you... The, the, this car only goes in reverse? How did you do that? He goes, well, you know, Abraham, he, when the angels came to destroy the nation of Lut, he negotiated. That must mean that you should negotiate with God and everything. I said, you know, you need to explain yourself more, my friend. I, I, don't, I don't understand. He goes, you know, I'll explain to you. It's like a father and a son relationship. When a son is small, the father tells him, sit over there, go over there, go over there, and he does it. The son just listens. Yeah? But when the son gets older and the father says, you should, go to, you should study accounting. And the son says, I think that I should study engineering instead. And he gives arguments. And the father says, okay, makes sense. So as the son gets older, he gets more mature, and he can make his own opinions, and he can argue with his father. And the father is proud of him, because my son is becoming a man, he can argue with me now. And I said, what does that have to do with Allah? We're not the son of Allah, Ma'adullah. What are you talking about? He goes, well, you know, the idea is the older you get, the more mature you get, the more you have the right to what? Argue. When you're a child, you just trust your parents. When you get older, you can argue. I was like, okay, I have one question. Ibrahim, they believe that the one that was slaughtered, the one that was slaughtered was who? We believe it's Ismail, they believe it is? So I asked him, when Abraham slaughtered Isaac, or he was trying to slaughter Isaac according to you, was he, was he a young man or an old man? 
Abraham was an old man. I was like, so as he got older, he should be arguing with Allah even more, yeah? According to you. So when the angels are going to kill another nation, he argues. But according to you, when he's going to kill his own son, he doesn't argue. He should at least say, yeah, look, that's my son. Can you uh, give me a discount here a little bit? Can I just slap him instead instead of, you know? No? There's no negotiation. You know? فَلَمَّا أَسْلَمَا وَتَلَّهُ لِلْجَبِينَ what are you talking about? He got older, but he increased in submission, not in negotiation. Oh, he goes, you make an interesting point. I was like, okay, that's enough then. <laughs> that's their, that's their, the rabbi's way of saying, I don't want to talk to you anymore. Is when they say, you make an interesting point. <laughs> but anyway, let's move along. You know, آمن الرسول بما أنزل إليه من ربه والمؤمنون Mu'minun are in the beginning or at the end? They're at the end. Because you know, in some sense, our iman and the iman of Rasulullah cannot be compared. Even though jama'ana, jama'a baynahu wa baynana fil bifi'lin wahid, amana. Right? It's one verb. But there is a difference between our iman and the Messenger's iman. And the similar language is used in the Quran when Ibrahim alayhi salam was building the Kaaba. Allah says, wa idh yarfa'u Ibrahim al qawa'ida min al bayt wa. Ismail فَأَخَّرَ ذِكْرِ Ismail عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ He put it all the way at the end. Why? Because Ibrahim عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ is the chief architect. He is the main architect. And who's the assistant? Ismail عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ Ismail عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ is helping. But he's not the same status as Ibrahim عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has Iman. Our Iman is not the same status. You say, you, you guys know. لَيْسِ الْخَبَرْكَ الْمُعَيَنَةَ Right? It's not the same. اللَّحْظُ أَصْدَقُوا إِمْبَاءً مِنَ اللَّفْظِ فَنُؤْمِن بِاللَّفْظِ You know, he, he's on a different level. The Rasul says some Ziman is on a different level. Now, I'm going to move along. The believers are being talked about. All of them believed in Allah, His books, His, you know, uh, His messengers. We, the Muslims, are actually, one of our jobs in the world is to restore the integrity and the beauty of all the messengers and all the previous books. And you can only do that when you share the Qur'an with the entire world. The, the Jews don't know who Moses is, I tell you. They don't know who Abraham is. The Christians don't actually know who Jesus is. We know who he is and we have to tell them. People think when you give da'wah to, da'wah to Islam, you have to tell people who Muhammad is sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I argue they will not appreciate Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa because they don't even appreciate their own prophets yet. The Qur'an has come to restore the dignity of their prophets. I go to churches and I talk about Jesus. I go to churches and I talk about Moses. I talk about Abraham from the Qur'an. I was talking about Ibrahim alayhi salam in one of the durus and the same rabbi was sitting in the audience. He was crying the whole time. He was crying the whole time. And everything I say is the opposite of what he reads. The opposite. And he's still crying. Because they know. They know. This is our job, people. We have to know this book and we have to share the beauty of this book. Now, I, I don't want you to forget, so I keep reminding you where are we? Where is this scene? In the company of Allah. Listen to the next words carefully. لا نفرق بين أحد من رسله لا نفرق بين أحد من رسله We do not make any distinction between any of the messengers. We do not make any distinction. Who's speaking? This is كلامنا. نحن لا نفرق بين أحد من رسله We don't make any distinction between messengers. The speaker is us. And it's in what person? You know there's third person and second person and first person. Third person is they don't distinguish between messengers. Second person would be you don't distinguish between messengers. First person would be what? We don't distinguish between messengers. When you say we, that is the first person. Now rhetorically speaking, the third person is the furthest. He is far away. You is closer. And nobody is closer to you than who? Yourself. Allah Azza wa Jal in this ayah directly put us 
what comes out of our mouth directly on that, in that place. He quoted us. We quote Allah, in this instance, Allah is quoting us. لَا نُفَرِّقُ بَيْنَ أَحَدٍ SubhanAllah. Talk about the honor given to the Muslims in these ayat. These ayat have a special place for a reason. وَقَالُوا سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا غُفْرَانَكَ رَبَّنَا By the way, when we say we don't make any distinction between prophets, I want to clarify an important confusion that Muslims have, that I've seen many times, that we need to get, let go of. In the Qur'an, does Allah talk about Yusuf alayhi salam? Yeah, He talks about Musa alayhi salam. So we learn lessons from the life of Yusuf and the life of Musa alayhi salam. Some people say, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we don't learn too much from them because their sharia is mansukh. Their, their, the, the law that was given to them, the wahi that was given to them, no longer applies. We believe in the sharia given to who? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi Ya ayyuhal insan. It is mentioned in the Qur'an, and when it's mentioned in the Qur'an, it is mentioned because these parts of their legacy are timeless. Allah does not mention something in the Qur'an because it does not apply. Allah mentions something in the Qur'an because it will always apply. Even if it's from Yusuf alayhi salam, even if it's from Adam alayhi salam, even if it's from Musa alayhi salam. What kind of a, an idiotic thing it is to say, well, no, 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 this is not Sharia at Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Wait, it's in the Quran, which is, it is the Sharia of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You mean the only time we listen to Quran is when it's talking about Rasulullah? This is what this ayah solves. لا نفرق بين أحد من رسله. Every messenger is valuable to us. Every messenger is valuable. By the way, these messengers are so valuable that they were even valuable to Rasulullah himself sallallahu alayhi wasallam. How does a Muslim say they're not valuable to us? We only care about Rasulullah. By the way, by extension, how many people got upset because of Charlie Hado? Show of hands. How many people got upset because of the cartoon in, you know, incident? I was upset. I was really upset. How many people get upset because of the Simpsons? Because of Family Guy? Because Jesus is made fun of. Because Moses is made fun of. There's no protest in the Muslim world because Jesus was made fun of. There's no protest because Moses was made fun of. There's no protest because Adam was made fun of. They, make, they draw naked pictures of Adam and Eve. Nobody, no Muslim gets offended. Oh, that's just Christians. What? These are our messengers. They're not their messengers. La nufarriku bayna ahadim rusuli. We are supposed to stand for all the messengers, all the same. What's the point of believing in this Qur'an if we don't do that? No, 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 that's just a Christian thing. That's just a, you know, they, they can do that. That's their, prop, that's their prophets. Qur'an came and said, those are all your prophets. The Rasul Sallallahu combines the best qualities of all the prophets in one. And when the Rasul Sallallahu is going through difficult times, when Rasul Sallallahu himself is having a difficult time, Allah gives him ayat about other prophets. Listen to me carefully. When the prophet is stressed, Sallallahu Alaihi what does Allah tell him about? Other prophets. So in his most difficult hour, Allah gives him the examples of Yusuf. Yeah? مَا أَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْقُرْآنَ لِي تَشْقَى هَلَا تَعْكَ حَدِيثُ مُوسَى You're having trouble? Think about Musa. How can the Rasul himself sallallahu alayhi wa sallam find comfort in these prophets and we don't find comfort in these prophets? Finding comfort and finding guidance in these prophets is a sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is what we have to do. Now we're being quoted, we don't make any distinction between prophets. قَالُوا سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا وَقَالُوا سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا These people say, said, we hear and we what? We obey. Allah is so proud of people who believe. And then He says, here's what belief means. These people hear and they what? Obey. Two, how many parts of this instruction? Two. The first part is hearing, the second part is obeying. The problem is we don't hear and we don't obey. If you want to hear, you have to go listen to what Allah is saying. You have to make time for the Qur'an. You have to make time for ma unzila ilayhi min rabbihi. You have to sit in the durus. You're sitting here right now, what are you doing? Sami'na. When this dars is done, what are you gonna do? Ata'na. <laughs> you understand? 
to this, what we're doing right now is fulfilling what Allah mentioned on Al-Arsh. Can you imagine? You just think you're sitting in a program in a nice auditorium. We're fulfilling an ayah of Allah. The angels are writing this down. Allah is proud of us. Allah Himself takes pride in us when we do these things. Don't underestimate the value of these things. People just think they're putting an event together. This organization's name is called Bayina, it's called Falaq, it's called Say One Care. They're doing this. No, 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 no. These are believers doing Allah's work and Allah recognizes it as that. These labels don't mean anything. What really means is what's actually happening when the word of Allah is being shared. I was raised in, uh, in, in a Pakistani family. I don't, you know, I think most of you that have raised, been raised in an average Muslim family, until the time that you are teenagers or even 20 years old, you know very little about the Quran. Very, very little about the Quran. You memorize some surahs, you've heard some khutbahs here and there, but you never actually took the time to study or think about or ponder, reflect on the Quran. True or no? Which means we are an ummah, ma sami'na. We didn't hear. Now if you don't hear, obviously you're not going to what? Obey. So if you want to fix the problem of the ummah, people keep saying, they Muslims have to obey, Muslims have to obey, Muslims have to obey. I say, no, ya rajul. Muslims have to what first? Listen. Let them listen first. When they listen, then if there is good in their heart, they will obey. We're not even giving them a chance to listen. That's what we have to do right now. That's what has to happen. وَقَالُوا سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا And the other reason, <coughs> by the way, you could just say أَطَعْنَا وَقَالُوا أَطَعْنَا يَا رَبْ أَطَعْنَا Why is سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا There's a reason. Without سَمَعْ they cannot be ta'a. Okay? لَوْ لَا سَمَعْ فَلَنْ يَكُونَ طَعَ فَلَنْ تَكُونَ طَعَ You don't have سَمَعْ you're not going to have طَعَ If we do not provide the opportunity to the entire ummah to understand the beauty of the word of Allah, to hear the kalam of Allah in a loving way, Rasul ﷺ taught it in a loving way, Allah taught it in, the, in, in a merciful way, Ar-Rahman عَلَّمَ Quran. not Al-Jabbar عَلَّمَ Quran. Ar-Rahman عَلَّمَ Quran. It has to be taught with Rahmah. When you teach Qur'an with Rahmah, then people will listen. And when they listen, naturally what will come? Obedience. The problem is, we keep complaining about obedience and we don't give them a chance to listen. We don't give them a chance. Rasul did he expect people to come to him or did he go to the people? He went to the people. What do we do? We expect the people to come to us. They don't come to the masjid, these people. لا يحضرون الحلقات ما لهم What's wrong with these people? They don't attend the halaqa, they don't attend the masjid. They don't. What's wrong with you man? You have to follow the, the, the guidance of the messenger. I said, you have to go to them. You have to go to them. Which means we have to learn to figure out how do we reach them? How do we reach people? We have to reach them through television, through the internet, through friends. We have to reach them at restaurants. We have to, we have to reach them at the university. We have to reach them while they're playing sports. Share something with them. Not everything has to be formalized. Not everything has to be formalized. Actually, I reached you before you reached me. You know that, right? I reached you how? YouTube, podcasts. I got some, I got some way of getting to you. I messed you up somehow. And then I came here. And I, I, I came from a short distance, you came from a long distance from home. But you know, I came here, but you had to come here, right? You came, you're ready, to, why are you here? It's like, it's a nice evening, you could be doing so many other things. There must be some really nice shawarma places here, you know. Why are you here? You know, this, the fact that you came here is actually a kind of itara. You took an act, you, you got in your car. You left home. You didn't watch a movie. You didn't listen to some, you know, sit here, someone listen to some songs or something. You came here. This is an act of obedience. But this happened because you did what first before? Listen first. This formula works, guys. We don't have to reinvent it. We just have to use it effectively. 
Now we say ghufranaka rabbana. By the way, the Banu Israel, the nation who came before us, they were also told, you know, to listen. You know, وَقَالُوا قَالُوا سَمِعْنَا وَعَصَيْنَا وَاسْمَعُوا Listen! And they said, we listen and we disobey. We listen and we disobey. But this Qur'an is not like the Torah. It's not. This Qur'an is mu'jiz. This Qur'an made even the kuffar fall into sajda. Even kuffar fell into sajda. Which means if this Qur'an is presented properly, it's going to be very hard to turn away. And if people are not listening to the, the word of Allah, that must mean nothing is missing in the word of Allah. You know what it means? We don't know how to ex explain it. We don't do a good job in you know, showing how it's beautiful. Nothing is wrong with the book of Allah. Something is wrong with us. If we did our job, people would be affected. غُفْرَانَكَ رَبَّنَا We beg your forgiveness, Arab. We beg you for forgiveness. We are being contrasted with Banu Israel. Banu Israel, وَقُولُوا حِطَّةٌ نَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ خَطَيَاكُمْ They were told, say, Hitta. Allah will forgive your sins. And what did they do? Hinta. They changed it. فَبَدَلَ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا قَوْلًا غَيْرَ الَّذِي قِيلَ لَهُمْ They changed the word. But these believe, this Ummah, they turned to Allah, Ya Allah, we are ready to obey you. Forgive us. Forgive us. سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا غُفْرَانَكَ is strange. Listen to why it's strange. We hear, we obey, we beg you to forgive us. Wait, you should ask for forgiveness not when you obey, you should ask for forgiveness when you disobey. Right? That's logical, isn't it? When you don't listen, you should ask for forgiveness. When you disobey, you should ask for forgiveness. Now Allah is saying, we hear, we obey, please forgive us. Why? Because Ya Allah, for a long time we didn't hear. And for a long time we didn't obey. Please forgive us. We're ready now. I'm here now, Ya Allah, forgive me. You know what this ayah is giving you? This ayah is giving you the ultimate chance. If you haven't been listening and you haven't been obeying, the door is not closed. Allah opened that door in the arsh. Oh, Rana Rabbana. It's so beautiful. He's, he's opened that door for you. There's never too late. Never too late. Don't let anybody tell you that you're going to Jahannam, that you're a munafiq, that you're worthless, that you're evil, that you don't have iman. We are so cruel to each other. Wallahi, I get so angry. I don't get angry at the political situations in the world. I get angry at the psychological torture Muslims do to each other. I get really angry about that. I met a woman just right now when I was in Qatar. I met a woman who lost her baby. Her baby was three months old and he died. She's, she wants to talk to me. She couldn't finish her sentence, she kept crying. She says, I want to see him in my dream. Is that okay? My, 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 my family tells me that I don't have sabr. This is not good adab with Allah, that you want to see your child in your dream. <clears throat> I don't even say, Ya ayyuhal insan. I say, Ya ayyuhal himar. <laughs> it's a mother. She lost her baby. She misses her baby. She wants to see her baby in her dream. And you're saying she doesn't have sabr? What is wrong with you? Yaqub wants to see Yusuf or no? Is he sad for years or years or no? And is, does, he, is, does he have sabr? Man qal fa sabrun jameel. If a father, Yaqub a prophet has a right to have sabr and still cry and still be sad to the point where his eyesight goes away. How are you telling a woman she doesn't have sabr? How dare you? We do this to people. We do this to people. This other brother came to me. He says, when I read Quran, I stumble. Like that. He says, I, a shaykh was telling me that if your heart was clean, you could recite purely. He's crying. He says, Ya Allah. He says, Ustad Maman, could you tell me what I have done wrong? Because Allah is not letting me read Quran. Clean you know, I must be doing a lot of sins, right? I said, No. I said, You know, Musa used to stutter. 
which means he did not have perfect tajweed when he recited Torah. You know that, right? Walaya kadu, you be. Wanaqulu fihi. Lakajahum Rasulun Kareem. Kareem Akramahullah. Walaya kadu, you be. Allah gave a messenger a stutter and he was a noble messenger of Allah. How are you telling someone they don't recite Quran purely or they don't have the perfect tajweed or they stumble, they must not be a good person. How dare you do that? Allah is willing to, He just wants to see effort from you. What's the point of the hadith? وَالَّذِي يَقْرَأُ الْقُرْآنَ وَيَتَتَعْتَعْ فِيهِ وَهُوَ عَلَيْهِ شَاقْ فَلَهُ أَجْرَانَ What's the point? reads Qur'an, he stumbles in it, he has a hard time, he still gets twice the reward. He gets double, because he has a hard time and he still goes through it. He still struggles. We make people feel guilty in the name of Islam, and wallahi, we are dishonest to Islam when we do that. It's a big crime before Allah. Allah wants to forgive and you want to punish. Allah wants to give a second chance and you want to close the door. This is what the Ummah has to stop. When you study Qur'an, the door gets opened. When you don't listen to Allah's book, you end up closing doors. You make more things haram than Allah made haram. In your mind, everything is haram until proven halal. <laughs> what is wrong with you, dude? He put things in this world so you can live well. He didn't make this world life for you to be miserable. We ask Allah for forgiveness. Ya ghufranaka rabbana. We will make mistakes. Even when we obey you, we're not going to obey perfectly. Even when we listen, we're not going to listen perfectly. Like that girl over there who's on Facebook right now. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> you know? You're not going to listen. It's okay, Allah forgive. Ghufranaka rabbana. Wa ilayka al masir. And to you alone is the place of return. I want to tell you a little bit about the word masir. This is going to be a long lecture. I'm not nearly done. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to say, I just need five more minutes. I'm just going to keep talking until my voice goes. If you want to sleep, go ahead. <laughs> if you want to talk to your friends in the meantime, go ahead. I have six children. I can talk through anything. <laughs> it doesn't matter to me. Okay? Now, I want to tell you about the word masib. There are two meanings, there are two. You know, Ibn al-Faris argues that Sara, Sara Yasiru combines two meanings. He says, Fulanun ala sayr al-amr. Yani fi muntaha al-amr. Sayr also means the end of something. Which is why some translations say, Ilayk al masir to you alone is the final return. Yeah? That's masir. But Sara also means asbaha. Sara Musliman bi ma'na asbaha Musliman. He became a Muslim to transform. The combination of those meanings. To you, Allah, is the place where we will finally return. And heading to you, we will experience transformation. What Allah is telling us is when we are before Allah on Judgment Day, we will be a completely different creature. We will not be the same. You know? This is not al-nash'at al-ukhra. This is Nashat al This is something else. But as we are journeying to Allah, we are every single day experiencing some transformation. Every single day something is changing inside of us. That is what's supposed to happen. Your goal, listen to me carefully, your goal is not to memorize the Qur'an. Your goal is not to learn Arabic. Your goal is not to know all of Tajweed. Your goal is not to do this number of ibadah or that. Your goal is not to get ijazat in all the uloom. This is not your goal. Your goal is progress. Your goal is what? Progress. Does everybody make the same progress? Some people make slow progress, some people make fast progress. Allah does not care. All Allah cares is that you are making progress. I told this young fellow who couldn't recite Quran, you know there are people who recite Quran beautifully, beautifully. You listen to them and you're like, oh my God, this is like the voice of an angel. It was amazing. But that guy is worthless to Allah because his, if, if he only recites Quran to impress people. Worthless. And you sitting in your living room, 
taking 30 minutes to recite Fatiha and you can't recite the Ha properly, you're desi, you say, غَيْرِ الْمَغْزُوبِ أَلَيْهِمْ وَلَزْوَالِينَ If you do that, you're, but you're trying, your shaykh says, غَيْرِ 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 المغضوبي 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 ضالين زوالين ضالين زوالين and you know what nobody is impressed with your recitation but he loves it he loves it but even though your, your recitation is totally pindu is horrible. To me it's bad. To Allah He loves it. Why? Because you're trying. Because you are trying. That's all. That's all it is. We have made artificial goals. There are some people who study Quran. Ladies, I'm talking to you. You have a problem. You have some of you study deen. You have obsessive compulsive disorder. Until I know all the words of the Quran. I don't know anything. Until I don't memorize this surah, I don't know anything. Oh my God, I have to finish Tafsir ibn Kathir. Then I have to finish Ibn Ashur. Then I have to finish. Relax, ladies. Calm down. You have to make progress. You do not, this deen of, this book is so beautiful. But you have to balance your life. You have to, you have to study deen a little bit. Then you have to live your life. Because the Quran wants you to stop reading Quran. You know that? The Quran doesn't want you to read the Quran all day. Allah, Yaqul subhanahu wa ta'ala, Siru fil ard. Afalam yanzuru ila tayri fawqahum. Fakayfa yanzuru ila tayri fil maktaba. Idhab. Go outside, go look at a bird. Here's a Quran exercise, go look at a bird. Safatin wa yaqbillah. Go look at the mountain. Go look at the mountain. أَفَلَمْ يَسِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ فَيَنْظُرُوا كَيْفَ بَدَعَ الْخَلْقِ Go look at all kinds of creation on the earth. What is the tafsir of وَالْأَرْضَ وَضَعَهَا لِلْأَنَامِ تَعْرِفُونَ الْآيَا وَالْأَرْضَ وَضَعَهَا لِلْأَنَامِ The earth, he made it for all kinds of creatures. You know what the meaning of that is? يَقُولُ ابْنُ كَثِيرُ رَحِمَهُ اللَّهِ يَقُولُ الْقُرْتُمِ يَقُولُ ابْنَ عَشُو and look at the different kinds of creatures Allah put on the earth. You want the tafsir of this ayah? You need to go to the land. You need to see different species. You need to see different, different kinds of animals. That is the tafsir of this ayah. وَالذَّارِيَاتِ ذَرْوَى Winds that sail. You can read tafsir of the ayah. When are you going to experience the ayah? When the wind blows. Allah wants you to experience life. He doesn't want you to experience a library, guys. You're not a good Muslim if you study deen your whole life. That is not what Allah wants. By the way, that's what rabbis do. They study 17 hours a day. They study a lot. That's all they do is study. They become weird people. You know people who study a lot? They're strange people. You know that, right? Because they don't deal with people. They deal with what? Books. When you deal with books, you don't know how to deal with people. So they're always awkward. <laughs> Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to deal with people all the time. He had a balance in his life. People say, I have no time. I have no time for my family because I'm studying deen. Pardon my language. What are you talking about? <laughs> you idiot. What are you talking about? You know Surah Al-Hujurat? Surah Al-Hujurat? إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُنَادُنَكَ مِنْ وَرَاءِ الْحُجُرَاتِ أَكْثَرُهُمْ لَا يَعْقِلُونَ People come to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they knock on his door and he is where? Is he in the masjid? Is he giving da'wah somewhere? Where is he? At home. He's at home. And they come and ask him. And Allah says, don't bother him. When sahaba stay too late at the Prophet's house, this is fi sabilillah. But Allah reveals the ayah, you need to go. Leave him alone. He has a family life. He has a family life. We, we read these ayat, we don't apply them. We have to find balance in this. Otherwise, we're going to turn into Bani Israel, and that's not a good thing to be. It didn't work out for them, let me tell you. So now, this transformation, وَإِلَيْكَ الْمَصِيرِ 
still on al ash al azim la yukallifu Allahu nafsan illa wusaha Allah does not put any burden on anybody except that it is within their capacity illa wusaha there's a this is this two meanings here and the second meaning is complicated i pray to allah that he gives me the ability to simplify it for you because it's very powerful you see la yukallifu allahu nafsan illa bi wus'iha is different except within its capacity but he says illa wus'a bila harf bila wasil just straight illa wus'aha there's a difference the first meaning is Allah will never tell you to do something that you cannot do. That's easy, easy meaning. Yeah? Allah will never tell you to do something that you cannot do. Some people say, MashaAllah, you pray five times? Wow, that's amazing. All five? Every day? On time? MashaAllah. Make dua, Allah gives me tawfiq. I only have 10 minutes. No way. I have like an hour. Okay, I have 10 minutes. God. I, I only, I don't know what to do in 10 minutes, but you know, لا يكلف الله نفسه إلا وسعها. You will pray five times every day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? That's because, you, know, you never say to someone, you stop at red lights? Everyone? <laughs> every day? <laughs> Amazing. Make, make dua, Allah gives me tawfiq. <laughs> you, you respect Allah, it's not a big deal. It's not too hard. Allah never gave you any regulation that's too hard, ever. Allah wouldn't put any difficulty in the deen for you at all. It's Allah's promise. That's Allah's promise. Here's the second meaning. Oh, this is epic. Wusr, wusr is the extent to which you can do something. Okay? Wusr then means your full potential. Wusr means what? Your full potential. Is my potential the same as your potential? No. And your potential is not the same as my potential. Allah will not give you responsibility in your life to every single person except that they have in them the ability to handle their problems, their challenges. Allah wants to make you realize your full potential. This is why Allah does not say here, لا يكلف الله الناس No, لا يكلف الله النفس No, نفسا النكرة Why? Every person is different. Every person has a different kind of potential. You have to identify your potential and then Allah will ask you, why didn't you give me the best of your potential? I gave you so much intelligence, why didn't you use your brain? I gave you so much social skills, how come you didn't make more friends and make that a way to bring people to Islam? I gave you so much creativity, why didn't you become a film producer and teach people Islam through film? Why didn't you do it? You had so much potential. I gave you that potential. Allah gave us that. Give, spend to Allah for Allah what He has given you. He left some things with you. Allah says, I will not put a burden on you. So when I say, I could be doing a lot of things with my life, and you could think, MashaAllah, that was a good talk. I only slept for one hour. But if, you, if you're listening to this, you could be impressed with what I do. But I cannot be impressed with what I do. Because I know I have more what? Potential. There's so much stuff I haven't done that I'm capable of doing. And Allah did not put that on. The burden on me is my potential. That's the second meaning. My load, my, my responsibility is my potential. Not just the ahkam of Allah. Because the ahkam of Allah, Wallahi hiya khafifa. Yuridu Allahu an yukhafifa ankum. Allah wants to lighten your burden. The deen of Islam is easy. No, no, no. But your potential that will make you go high, that is something else. When an athlete wants to perform at the peak performance, does he have to go through hard training? Yeah. He has to go through torture every day. The amount of exercise, the amount of you know, rigorous training, the, the nasty food he has to eat. 
And he can't eat cake, he can't drink soda, he can't do all that stuff because he has to meet his potential. You have to make sacrifices to reach your potential. And Allah told you that on Al Ash Azim. No excuses, people. No excuses. Everybody better hit their potential. Laha ma kasabat wa alayha maktasabat. It will you will have to your advantage whatever you earn. Easily. And earning with Allah is easy. Every time you make efforts, it is easy earning with Allah. Wa alayha maktasabat. And against it, it what he you people make so much effort to earn. People make so much effort to, you know, sin is actually difficult. Allah is saying your fitra, fitrat Allah, fitrat al nas, lati fatra Allah alayha, fitrat Allah lati fatra Allah alayha, fatra al nas alayha. The, 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 the nature on which Allah made you is obedience is easy. Is easy. Yashrah sadrahu lil Islam. His chest becomes open. He can breathe easy when he obeys Allah. But when he disobeys Allah, his chest becomes tight. Alik tisa. Fihi tamahul wa mudda wa jtihad wa ibta. Sins, what the things we do that hurt us, they actually, Allah is refer, reversing the equation. You know, for a lot of people, they think sins are easy, obedience is difficult. When believers believe, all their definitions change. When you really have iman, your definitions change. For everybody else, sins are easy, obedience is difficult. But Allah used the easy word with good deeds, and He used the difficult word with sins. Lahaba. كَسَبَتْ أَسْهَلْ وَعَلَيْهَا مَكْتَسَبَتْ أَصْعَبْ For you, obedience is easy and disobedience is difficult. If you have iman. And this will be the gift of Allah to you. For everyone else, disobedience will be easy. For you, Allah will make disobedience difficult. And for you, for everyone else, obedience to Allah will be difficult. And for you, obedience to Allah will be easy. This is laha ma kasabat wa alayha maktasabat. What an amazing gift from Allah. He reverses the reality for most people. If they just have iman. Allahumma ja'ala minhum. Rabbana, Rabb, now we make dua to Allah. La tu'akhidna, please don't grab us. Don't hold us. In nasina aw akhta'na. If we forget or if we keep making mistakes. Is forgetting a small problem or a big problem? Some people, they think it's a small problem. I forgot, no big deal. No big deal. Let me tell you how big Nisyan is. وَلَقَدْ عَهِدْنَا إِلَىٰ آدَمْ مِنْ قَبْلْ فَنَسِيَا Why did Adam السلام, get sent to the earth? One of the reasons Allah describes, because he forgot. Forgetfulness can get you out of Jannah. According to the Quran. Forgetfulness is not a small problem, it is a big problem. Now let me tell you about forgetfulness. A couple of comments are necessary about forgetfulness. Uh, the, the best example I can think of is Surah Al-Mujadala. يَوْمَ يَبْعَثُهُمُ اللَّهُ جَمِيعًا فَيُنَبِّئُهُمْ بِمَا عَمِلُوا أَحْصَاهُ اللَّهُ وَنَسُورُ The day on which Allah will gather people, He will tell them what they did, Allah will record what they did, but they had forgotten it. You forget something when it's not a big deal. You forget something when it's not a big deal. When something is important, you don't forget. When something is not that important, you forget. I'll call you back. Hey, you never called me back. Oh, I forgot. Okay? But if your wife calls you, you better call her back. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you love your life, then you better not forget. You, if you tell her you forgot, <laughs> it was nice knowing you. Acha, you forgot. You come home, I tell you what forgot. La tu akhidna in nasina. Don't grab us when we, if we forget. How do people forget? When does a when does a young man forget to pray? When he's watching a movie. He's watching a movie. The curtains are drawn. He's watching. Watching. Maghrib came. Maghrib left. Oh. I miss Maghrib. I totally forgot. That's when you forget. You forget when you get busy with things that are less important and you leave things that are more important. You have to make an effort in your life to not allow important things to be forgotten. This takes planning and it takes effort. It doesn't happen automatically. We are asking Allah 
رَبَّنَا لَا تُؤَاخِذْنَا إِنَّ نَسِينَا أَوْ أَخْتَأْنَا Notice uh, استعمال الماضي إِنْ نَنْسَ أَوْ نُخْطِئْ لا إِنْ نَسِينَا أَوْ أَخْتَأْنَا فما الفرق بين المضارع والماضي في الشرط When you put a conditional statement When you use the past tense If we forgot If we made a mistake The benefit of that is That it should happen once المضارع فيه استمرار والتكرار الماضي فيه حدوث مرة واحدة فقط This has happened one time. Ya Allah, if one time I forget, if one time I make a mistake, forgive me. You're not telling Allah, Ya Allah, you know I forget a lot. So, by the way, I make a lot of mistakes. So just forget. No, no, no. Ya Allah, I will do my best never to make a mistake. I will make my best, do my best never to what? Forget. But will it happen? Yes, it will happen. But it, it won't happen on purpose. If it was the present tense, it would have allowed for you to forget and make mistakes on purpose. Just the past tense alone is letting you know that this cannot happen on purpose. It's a once in a while thing. Yes, it will happen. But Ya Allah, just don't grab us. By the way, Banu Israel were grabbed. Adam alayhi salam was grabbed because he forgot, yeah? And now we're saying, Ya Allah, give us more rahmah than Adam alayhi salam. Because when Adam alayhi salam was grabbed, think about this. Adam alayhi salam was grabbed. He went from Jannah to where? Earth. So he went from high to what? Low. If we get grabbed, we get low to really low. Because he went from the top floor to the bottom floor. But there's a basement too. Where's the basement? Jahannam. There's Jannah on top, dunya in the middle, Jahannam at the bottom, yes? Adam alayhi salam, because he forgot, he went from the top floor to what? The middle. If we forget and get grabbed, what's gonna happen? Middle to the bottom, we can't afford that one. <laughs> لا تؤاخذنا إلا سينا أو أخطأنا. We can't fall. We can't afford to fall more than this. He was told, إهبطوا. إهبطوا منها جميعا. You know, we cannot have more هبوط. We can't afford it. So now, ربنا ولا تحمل علينا إسرا. I love this word. Ya Allah, don't burden us with a. Don't load onto us an إسر. And Isr. لِمَا لَمْ يَقُلْ لَا تَحْمِلْ عَلَيْنَا حَمْلًا وِقْرًا وِزْرًا إِسْرًا Isr is used in the meaning of a burden. But so are so many other words that are used in the Qur'an. So many words for burden, you know. وَوَضَعْنَا عَنْكَ إِسْرَكْ إِسْرَكْ You know. So why Isr? Isr is actually used for something that is tied up. Something that's packed up. When something is tied up, it is trapped. This ayah has a lot of meanings. I'll give you the easy meaning first. The easy meaning is, Ya Allah, don't put a burden on us like you put on the people before us. كَمَا حَمَلْتَهُ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِنَا But there's another meaning. The other meaning is, when people disobey Allah, when people disobey Allah, then sometimes Allah punishes them in this world. You know that, right? When a believing nation disobeys Allah, like Banu Israel were a believing nation, when they disobeyed Allah, Allah gives them different kinds of punishments. You know, disbelieving nations, when they disobey Allah, they are destroyed. Believing nations, when they disobey Allah, Allah gives them different kinds of burdens. Allah gives them what? Different kinds of burdens. One kind of burden, when, when, when an ummah, when a believing ummah disobeys Allah, Allah does not punish them with fire from the sky or a flood or an earthquake. How does He punish them? He punishes them by broke, breaking them up into groups that hate each other. One punishment is He breaks them into groups and what, what do the groups do? They hate each other. This is a punishment from Allah for an ummah that disobeys Allah. You wouldn't know anything about that of course. <laughs> the second punishment, and if you study Bani Israel, by the way, study Bani Israel in the Qur'an. You will find how does Allah punish a nation that disobeys Allah. An ummah, a believing ummah with prophets. And so you learn from that what will happen to us. Now let me tell you what happens to us. وَقَالُوا قُلُوبُنَا People believe, people think, they already understand the religion. There's nothing more to learn. I already know everything about the Qur'an. I, I learned tafsir already. Because to me, 
يو نو اذا قرات ابن تفسير ابن كثير هذا يعني فهمت القران كاملا ايها الانسان this is the book of Allah no human being can ever fully understand it this is not a human book this is a divine book but you know what happens people say i already know what the quran says i made up my mind i made up my mind and they wrap wrap themselves up and they become rigid the ummah becomes rigid and the book itself has rahmah in it but since you left the book the ummah becomes tougher and tougher and tougher and people that are supposed to be religious they are they, are, they end up becoming more religious than the sahaba they become more strict they make more things haram they make more things difficult they make more things harsh than even the deen of allah wants it to be and this makes the ummah turn away from the deen because when one group becomes rigid then they like to distinguish themselves from the other group and the other group becomes more rigid because every action has an equal but opposite reaction so now you got two extreme groups they both hate each other and most of you normal people are in the middle and you say i want to learn islam but the only two options are these crazy and these crazy so since they're both crazy you figure eh, i can't learn islam okay i i can't handle it we put these burdens on ourselves we put these burdens on ourselves i'll give you an example my teacher gave me my teacher uh, among them is dr akram nadwi may allah protect him he's a muhaddith and he's also uh, he's got 600 ijazat over over 400 in hadith alone over 40 in sahih al bukhari alone and he's a, a scholar of the hanafi school he came to our campus in Texas and he gave us a course on the fundamentals of Islam and here's the first thing he told us. First thing he told us was how many prophets were there? He asked us a question, how many prophets were there? Tell me how many prophets, you guys know? 100 and? 124,000, very good. How many prophets you know? Uh, uh, 50,000? 30,000? Okay, give me 10,000. Okay, fine. Give me 500. This is a reverse auction. I'll give you just, I'll give me 100. No? 50? 40? 25. 25. How many prophets are there again? 124,000. How many prophets do you know? 25. Do you know everything about them? Do you know everything they said? You know just some things they said, yes? Okay. Will Allah ask you on Judgment Day the names of all the Prophets? Are the Prophets important people? Yes. Will Allah ask you all of their names? Will Allah ask you everything they said? No. Allah will definitely not ask you who Abu Hanifa was. He will not ask you who Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah was. He's not going to ask you who Ahmad bin Hanbal was. Because if Allah was going to ask you names, it would have been names of who? Prophets. <coughs> so you don't have to know everything Abu Hanifa said. And you don't have to know everything Imam Shafi'i said. You just have to know what Allah said. That's what you have to know. And this is a Hanafi scholar, one of the top Hanafi scholars in the world. And this is the first day of his class. And I'm sitting there going, Is, is that okay? Is anybody else shocked? Because I come from Pakistan. And in Pakistan, you don't call yourself Muslim. You call yourself what? Hanafi. You call yourself, we call ourselves Sunni. We call ourselves Shafi'i. We like to call ourselves some other sticker. And Allah, the only sticker He wants for you is what? Muslim. And Islam is simple. But we like to make things what? Com we love complication. We love it. We love it. We love a kitab. Then we love the sharh of that kitab. Then we love the sharh of the sharh of the sharh of that kitab with a hashiyah. The deen is simple. It's simple. How many books have been written in the, in the history of Islam? For Islam? Uncountable. The, the father of this ummah is Ibrahim alayhi salam, yes? He's the father also of Banu Israel, yes? 
combine these two nations how many books have been written by the Jews how many books have been written by the by the Muslims in in Sharia how many books on Torah are there how much scholarship on Torah is there how much scholarship on Quran is there how long has it been going on the volumes are endless 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 and the father of all of these nations is who Ibrahim salam, the director of all the libraries is Ibrahim salam, yes now study Ibrahim salam. how complicated is he Oh Is he saying complicated things or simple things? The prophets in the Quran said simple things. We love to say complicated things. We are not like the prophets. We like we should learn from them a little bit. We we've complicated our religion. We have to bring it back to simple. Ya Allah, don't put a burden on us like you put on the people before us. Did the Jews complicate their religion? They complicated their religion, yes? Allah gave them something beautiful, simple, straightforward. They complicated it. Have the Muslims complicated their religion? رَبَّنَا لَا تَحْمِلْ عَلَيْنَا إِسْرًا كَمَا حَمَلْتَهُ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِنَا You understand what I'm saying to you? It's, this is the time, people. This is the time to relieve the burden. Allah brought the Quran to remove the burdens from them. You know, this ayah is so amazing. You will understand what Isra means because of this ayah. Jews had fiqh books that were endless. And for every mas'ala, every issue, they have a hundred opinions. They have a hundred opinions. It's crazy. It's, it's literally crazy. So many opinions on every issue. And then on top of that, they believe if the, if the alim passed a fatwa, that is Islam itself. That is what Allah wants. The, the fatwa of the rabbi is the same as the amr of Allah to them. To them. Muslims would never do that, right? Oh, wait. And this, they had this complicated, complicated religion. And then Allah sent them the Quran. And they said, we can't have this man. We can't accept him because he's Ummi. He doesn't even have a PhD. We have these complicated books and the Quran is what? Simple, straightforward. We can't have that. Allah says he came so he can remove your burdens. You burdened yourself with overcomplication and the deen came to make things simple. We love overcomplication. As a matter of fact, the more religious you get, the more religion you study, the more complicated you become. And the more complicated you make the lives of the people around you. <laughs> this book is, Ya Allah, don't put this burden on us. The more you study deen, the, the happier you should be, and the happier people around you should be. If the people around you are not happy, you are not learning Islam. I'm sorry. You're learning something else. You're learning Isr. You're learning Isr. How many people learn Islam and start fighting at home? Start conflicts at home, arguments at home, because of deen. That's not how you learn deen. Deen is supposed to increase love among people, not hate. That's what it's supposed to do, subhanAllah. I'll give you one more comment about that, because a lot of people have fights in their... You don't have to admit if you have one. How many people know of situations where people fight in the family, among friends, because of religion? <laughs> There's ijma and ikhtilaf. <laughs> Let me tell you something about that. Allah taught the Quran to the Quraysh, yes? Did the Quraysh, were the Quraysh good people most of them? Most of them did not accept. Well, in the beginning, most of them rejected. They became the worst enemies of Islam. How long did Allah keep teaching them? For more than a decade. Did they insult the Prophet did he still teach them? Did they try to hurt the Prophet ﷺ? He still taught them? Did they kill believers and he still taught them? More ayat came down, more ayat came down, more ayat came down. Every ayah is a gift from Allah. No gift on earth is more valuable than an ayah given by Allah. And Allah keeps giving these people gift and gift and gift and gift and gift. And this is Quraysh. أَعْدَاءُ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ فَعَلَّمَهُمْ وَلِذَلِكَ يَقُولْ الرَّحْمَانِ عَلَّمَ الْقُرْآنِ 
He is so incredibly loving and merciful that taught the Qur'an. Anybody else would not have that kind of patience, that kind of love. If Allah is so loving when He teaches the Qur'an to Quraysh, why don't you teach your family with some more love? Why don't teach your friends with some more love? Allah is patient with Quraysh, man. They even make fun of Rasul And He still just gives them ayat. Allah can teach in different ways. Like, you know, you guys go to school, right? You went to school, your teacher can teach you in different ways. He can teach you, hey, two plus two is four. I don't understand. Come here, let me tell you. Let me teach you in a way you will never forget. Come here. One, two, three, four. Two plus two, you understand? I understand. If you don't want to learn, there are other ways to teach you. Can Allah use other ways to teach them? Does He have the power to use other ways to teach them? Absolutely. But He teaches them with love. With Qur'an. You and I, somebody doesn't listen to us. I just told you the hadith and you didn't listen. <laughs> Calm down homie. Calm down. This is not what our religion is about. This is the isr we've put on our... And when you do that, your, your young generation will run from Islam. They will run away from Islam because they don't see any love and any mercy. All they see is rules and rules and rules and rules and rules. This is haram, that's haram, that's haram, that's haram. We have made, our, we have depressed our young people. We have made them believe that they are bad people. They are sinners. People come up to me and say, Ustad Naman, I have a question. I know I'm a bad person. I was like, how do you know you're a bad person? Why would you say that? Well, you know, because you know, I, I, wear, I wear like a t-shirt and jeans and sometimes I miss a lot and I'm a bad person. It's like, look, you make mistakes. People don't get to judge you. And you shouldn't even judge yourself. You should only let Allah judge you. You should only let Allah judge you. Don't give up on yourself. Don't tell yourself you're a bad person. That's not how it works. We make mistakes. We admit them. We learn from them. But we don't become depressed. Depression is not part of this deen. I don't know why it is nowadays. The more people study deen, the more socially awkward and angry they look. Why is that? Like, you know, the guy used to be smiling all the time, then he grew a beard and he's like... Why does your beard make you angry? Is it heavy? What? Your beard should make you smile, dude. I make you angry. It's supposed to be a religion of joy. فَبِذَانِكَ فَالْ يَفْرَحُ you go to the masjid, people of you. You are the person who is teaching Quran. And you are the person who is teaching Quran. And you are the person who is teaching Quran. I'm like avoiding eye contact. <laughs> this. Why, why, why do the Sahaba say Rasul is always smiling? This word, this word is supposed to be spread with joy. Rabbana wa la tuhammilna ma la taqata lana bihi. Ya Rabb, do not put a burden on top of us. Don't keep loading on to us burdens that we have no power to bear whatsoever. This is the dua. And because it is in the arch, there's a narration of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that when this dua was given to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that Allah, every time He gave him the ayat, He said, Qad fa'alt, Qad fa'alt. I did it. Ya Allah, don't put a burden on us at all that we have no power to bear. Done. Allah says, done. My believer asked me, it is done. I will never put anything on you you cannot bear. But then somebody comes and asks me and says, Ustad, I lost my child. I, I lost my child. Why did that happen? What was my fault? My in-laws tell me it's because I'm evil. No, your in-laws are evil. You're not evil. And that happened to you. One thing you should know, what happened to you, happened to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He lost child, he lost children, yes? Now you are feeling what Rasulullah felt. Now you have a closeness to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that most people will not have because you share, share a feeling with him. <coughs> and so the ayat, 
that were given to Rasulullah to make him feel better are now the ayat that are being given to you to make you feel better. Inna a'atainaka al kawthar. Those ayat for, for Rasulullah, and because you lost your child, these ayat are especially for you. Special gift of Allah to you. And Allah would never have you made you lose your child if He didn't He knew you cannot handle it. There are so many women who could not handle it. You are strong enough to handle it. And so he gave you a more difficult test so you can come so much more closer to him and earn the status, earn that closeness to Allah and earn that closeness to his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because the closer you get to Allah, the more sacrifices you have to make. So Allah chose you, you're special. You didn't lose your child because you're punished. And on top of everything else, there are people who live with their children their entire life. Alhamdulillah, may Allah keep our children safe. They live with their children their entire life. But their children grow up to be disobedient to Allah. Their children end up leaving Islam. Their children end up, you know, disappointing the deen. And then they have many, many generations of non-Muslims. And all of that, on Judgment Day, you will not love those children. You love them here. You will not love them there. If تَبَرَّعَ الَّذِينَ تُبِعُوا مِنَ الَّذِينَ تَبَعُوا وَرَأَوا الْعَذَابَ وَتَقَطَّعَتْ بِهِمُ الْأَسْبَابِ all the relationships will be cut. يُفِرُّ الْمَرْءُ مِنْ أَبِيهِ وَأُمِّهِ سُبْحَانَ وَصَاحِبَتِهِ وَبَنِيهِ Oh my goodness. You're going to be running from your kids. But that child who died, where did it go? It went to Jannah. And because of the sabr you showed, you are going to have a reunion with your child. Your reunion is guaranteed if you can just have iman. Other people, they have to beg for that reunion. Yours is guaranteed. Congratulations. Congratulations. Those children are just waiting for you. They're not gone. They're just waiting for you. What do we do with people? They have, we, this is the harshness and the ugliness of, of the, the Muslim who goes away from Allah's book. So somebody's child died, oh Allah must be punishing them, they must be cursed. Astaghfirullah al Don't Don't ruin people like that. Our Messenger would not do that, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. رَبَّنَا وَلَا تُحَمِّلْنَا مَا لَا طَاقَةَ لَنَا بِهِ وَاعْفُوا عَنَّا Pardon us. Ya Allah, lovingly forgive us. وَغْفِرْ لَنَا And cover our mistakes. Our mistakes are many, just, bear, just cover them. وَرْحَمْنَا And show us love and mercy. What is the order, what is the, best, the benefit of this sequence? وَاعْفُوا عَنَّا وَاغْفِرْ لَنَا وَرْحَمْنَا when you make a mistake, if, I, if, if, I, if my wife makes a mistake, I am what? Angry. Yeah? If I make a mistake, my wife is angry, my mother is angry, somebody's angry. The first thing is, I don't want you to be angry. That's the first part. I don't want you to be angry. And that is covered in the word afu. Al afu is actually forgiving someone out of love and letting go of the anger. When you let go of the anger, that is called afu. If you say maghfirah, yeah, that's fine, I won't need 10. When you, if you say maghfirah, if you say maghfirah, you forgave someone, but that does not mean the anger is gone. Okay? You, can, you forgave someone, but the anger is not gone. But if you do afu to someone, then you forgave them, and the anger is gone, and then after you have lovingly forgiven us, then on top of that cover our mistakes, waghfir lana, and please protect us and show us love and care. Warhamna means two things. Don't let us fall into sin to begin with. Keep us in your protection. Keep us in your rahmah. So we don't make the mistake to begin with. And second of all, once we have made the mistake and you have forgiven us, keep us in your rahmah, which means keep us in Jannah. And then once one sunnah ala al-qawmi al-kafirin, then aid us against the disbelieving nation. This is the last two points I want to make, but they're probably the most important. When you say, Ya Allah, don't hold us because of if we forget or make a mistake. Ya Allah, forgive us. Ya Allah, show us mercy. Is that about you or is that about someone else? That's about you. When he says, Fansurna ala al-qawmi al-kafirin, is that about you or someone else? Not someone else. Aid us against the disbelieving nation. So there seems to be a conflict, yes? Part of the dua was for you, and part of it is so you can, you can get help against the enemy. 
the question arises, why do you have an enemy? Why do you have an enemy? The Muslims have enemies today, yes or no? Yeah, sure. Did the Muslims have enemies at the time of the Prophet ﷺ? Yes or no? But it's not the same. It is not the same. They had the Quraysh for enemies to Rasulullah ﷺ, even though he was the kindest, softest, and they were enemies to him because he taught the message of the Qur'an. He taught that all human beings are equal. He taught that children have rights. He taught that women have rights. He taught that parents should be treated with respect. He taught that no tribe is better than no other tribe. He, try, he taught that no race is inferior to another race. And this is why he had enemies. Today Muslims have enemies. But we don't have enemies because we say all people are equal. We don't have enemies because we say we have to treat parents better. We don't have enemies because we are the best in character and we say everybody should be treating, everybody should be fair in business. As a matter of fact, Muslims are not very different from non-Muslims overall in their behavior today. Non-Muslims, if they don't care about their parents, where are Muslims today? If non-Muslims are racist and they think some races are better than others, what about Muslims today? What about, what are we doing? We have that problem or not? If non-Muslims think wealth makes you better, if you have wealth, you are better. If you don't have wealth, you are worse. And Islam came to say your money doesn't mean anything. Inna akramakum indallahi atqakum. That is the only thing that matters. That is the only. The only thing that matters is what you have in your heart. Today the Muslims live like that or no? Nope. And you know the proof of that? I don't want to blame governments. I don't want to blame countries. I'll talk about you and me personally. When you want to get your son married, do you look at the race? Do you look at the money? Do you look at these things? Because they have to be good enough for us? Or do you look at the character? Most people say, well if they have money, and they're Punjabi. <laughs> they must be good. Must have character automatically. The way we seek daughters, sons for our daughters, daughters for our sons. Pakistani ladies, I'm Pakistani so I make fun of Pakistanis because I have the right to. I don't have to make the right to make fun of Bangladeshis or the right to make fun of anyone. But I can make fun of myself. So I do it. You're looking for your son. You know they say in Arabic, Al Kirdu fi aini ummihi ghazal. Right? I'll say it in Urdu. Ma koto khota bi farishta nazar aata hai. Okay? So your son, ugly, ugly son. He looks in the mirror, the mirror cracks. Okay? And you want to get him married. And you go and you find, auntie I know, you find this girl, her nose is too long. This girl, her chin is too short. This girl is not white enough. Have you seen your son, lady? <laughs> but you have to check the color of the skin. In other words, we have enemies, but we don't have enemies for the right reasons. We have enemies for the wrong reasons. The ayat of the Qur'an apply فَانْصُرْنَا عَلَى الْقَوْمِ الْكَافِرِينَ When you have made enemies for the right reasons or the wrong reasons? The right reasons. And the right reasons are when you stand up for the integrity, the principles of Rasulullah When you make enemies for that reason, then yes, ask. فَانْصُرْنَا عَلَى الْقَوْمِ الْكَافِرِينَ When you don't do anything the Messenger did, and you say فَانْصُرْنَا عَلَى الْقَوْمِ الْكَافِرِينَ You're making joke of the ayat. You're making fun of the ayat. I even argue when they make fun of the Prophet ﷺ in these cartoons, some of these people are evil. They are evil. And they make fun of it no matter how much they know about Islam. But a lot of people make fun of Islam not because they, they make fun of the Prophet ﷺ. They don't even know the Prophet ﷺ. All they know is Muslims. And they see Muslims acting crazy. So they assume Islam must be what? Crazy. And that's when they make fun of Islam. It's not because of the Prophet, it's because of Muslims. 
ربنا لا تجعلنا فتنة للذين كفروا Don't turn us into a fitna for those who disbelieved. Subhanallah. This ummah has a long way to go. Here's my last comment to you and probably what I think the most beautiful thing guys. I hope you appreciate it because I am blown away by this. The journey of humanity began with one man, Adam alayhi salam. The journey of humanity will end with one ummah, the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The journey of the first man started in Jannah. The journey of this ummah will end in Jannah. Yes? And we ask Allah that He gives all of us Jannah and our children and their children and their children. وَالْمُسْلِمُونَ جَمِيعًا Okay. When that journey began, He was where? Jannah. Where is Jannah? If you read Surah Al-Najm, وَلَقَدْ رَآهُ نَزْلَةً أُخْرَى عِنْدَ سِدْرَةِ الْمُنْتَهَى عِنْدَهَا جَنَّةُ الْمَأْضَى I used to wonder, why did Allah mention Jannah there? He says he saw Allah, or he went to, you know, he, he, he went to meet with Allah Azza wa Jal and he saw him, another descent, he saw Jibreel alayhi salam, another descent, right under uh, Sidrat al-Muntaha, the, the low tree. And right under that is what? Right by that is Jannah. So Jannah is right under the arsh of Allah. It's right there. That's where Jannah is. Got it? Now, Adam alayhi salam was right there, wasn't he? And then Allah sent him where? Sent him down. And when he sent him down, what did he say to him? He says, فَإِمَّا يَأْتِيَنَّكُمْ مِنِّي هُدًا فَمَنْ تَبِعَ هُدَايَ فَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ If and when guidance comes to any of you, انظر إلى الضمير, كُمْ لَا إِمَّا يَأْتِيَنَّكَ إِمَّا يَأْتِيَنَّكُمْ يعني أنت you and your children if guidance comes to you from me then whoever follows it will have no fear no grief as he was coming down he was told look out for revelation yes so the journey of revelation began when did the journey of revelation end with Rasulullah when the journey of revelation began, a human being was coming down from right under the arsh and he was told, look out for guidance. And when the journey of revelation ended with Quran, a human being went up to the arsh to receive the last ayat of Baqarah. The first instance, the first talk of revelation happened right under that arsh. And the last book also has ayat that are right under that arsh. Just where the journey of human beings began. Right there again. SubhanAllah. So Adam alayhi salam, the beginning, and Rasulullah, and these ayat are like the end. And Adam alayhi salam is the beginning of Baqarah, and this ayat is at the end of Baqarah. How do you do that? How does he do that? Every time, I'm reading Quran sometimes, I'm studying Quran, sometimes I come across something, and I just go, Allah, how did you do that? That was awesome. I can't think anymore. I think I'm going to play some video games. Because this is too much to handle. <laughs> this Ummah, this Ummah is the last chapter of human history. This is it. The Quran has come. No other revelation is coming. Now the, all of humanity has to see what it means what did, why did Allah send people on the earth so they can follow guidance, yes? And the last of Hudan has come. Which means, we living in the last chapter of humanity, every single person who believes in Allah and His messengers, every single person here who believes in the final revelation, the Qur'an, we have to make sure that we give this message to as many human beings on this earth as possible. This is our responsibility. We have now been given the same responsibility as Rasulullah himself sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How do we know that? How do we know we have the same responsibility as Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the beginning, آمَنَ الرَّسُولُ بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْهِ مَنْ رَبِّهِ وَالْ مُؤْمِنُونَ فَالتَّكْلِيفِ لِلْرَسُولِ وَالتَّكْلِيفِ لَنَا وَلِذَلِكْ لَا يُكَلِّفُ اللَّهُ نَفْسًا إِلَّا وَسَحَا The burden is all of ours.
The burden is all of ours. We have to show the character of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We have to revive the, the integrity of Islam. People, they, they think of Muslims, you're living in a Muslim country, so you don't feel this as much. I live in America, I can tell you. I travel to Europe and other places, I can tell you. People think of Muslims as backwards. People think of Muslims as dishonest. People think of Muslims as corrupt. People think of Muslims as violent and uncivil. This is how they think of us. And we say to them, no, 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 no. We are not violent. We are the greatest ummah. We are the best people. We are extremely disciplined. Look at our salah. Look at how we line up in salah. We are so great. Look at the parking lot. Before you look at the salah, look at the parking lot outside. Look at how you drive. Look at how you, look at how you behave outside with each other. Look at that first. Or are we an example for the world to follow? We have to be the example for the world to follow in everything. In everything. In business, in education, in research, in scientific breakthroughs, in religious studies, in morality, in a balanced lifestyle. Everybody in the world should look at a Muslim and say, I want to be like that. I want to be like that. I am impressed. Who are these people? They should be able to say as sadiq wal amin before they even know we're Muslim. Is that important? Before they even know he's calling for Islam, what do they already know? As sadiq al amin. Do the people think of us as a sadiq and al amin? No, until that happens, we are not fulfilling our responsibility. La tahmil alayna isran kama hamal tahu ala ladila min qablina. Allah has put the biggest burden on this ummah. No bigger burden has ever been, put, been placed on an ummah. And that burden is to show us billions of Muslims together have to show what the character of Rasulullah looked like sallallahu alayhi wa So the world can see innaka la ala khuluqin azim li anna al-alam la yara rasul bal yara atba'a rasul The world does not see the Prophet. The world, the world sees us. Ambassadors of the Prophet. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We have to show it. We better raise our standards. I pray that Allah Azza wa Jal fulfills this dua for all of us. That is this remarkable dua. And this honor that Allah has given us in such a high place. I pray that Allah gives you and me, our family, our children, the ability to live up to this gift, this honor, this responsibility. And I pray that Allah blesses the people of this country and gives them love for each other and gives them the ability to be a model for the rest of the ummah to follow. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.